This is Medical Device Legal News. Today is June 13th, 2023. I'm Sam Bernstein. On June 1st, the United States Supreme Court in U.S. Axwell Schutte v. Supervalue ruled that the Federal False Claims Act covers a false claim submitted by a defendant that subjectively believed at the time of submission that the claim was false, even though the defendant subsequently offered a post hoc justification in the form of an objectively reasonable interpretation of the law at issue. As you may recall, a violation of the False Claims Act requires one, a claim to be false, and two, a person to knowingly present or cause someone else to present that false or fraudulent claim to the government for payment or approval. Knowingly is defined as having actual knowledge of the falsity, deliberate ignorance of the truth, or reckless disregard of the truth, meaning acting despite a substantial and unjustified risk of the falsity. We previously reported on the implications of this case for the key time relators bar and the Department of Justice amid a circuit split and how it may impact medical device companies. In particular, as you're likely aware, medical device companies may face substantial civil monetary penalties under the False Claims Act if they cause their customers to submit false or fraudulent claims to the federal government, um, as well as potential False Claims Act liability um, if they engage in federal anti-kickback statute violations to induce their customers to purchase, reward, order, or use their products. As previously reported, this case involves the reporting of pharmacies' usual and customary charges to Medicare and Medicaid, where the pharmacies were alleged to have known they were not accurately reporting their usual and customary charge because they were not reporting their discounted prices, allegedly. The falsity of the claims submitted by the pharmacies was not at issue before the Supreme Court, only the mental state, the scienter, the mens rea of the pharmacies. In other words, whether they knowingly submitted the false claims. The question before the court was whether the subjective intent of the defendant was determinative or whether a post hoc objectively reasonable justification could negate the bad intent of the defendant at the time of the claim submission. The Supreme Court ruled that whether the defendants knew the claim was false was determinative because the scienter element addresses the defendant's knowledge and subjective beliefs, not what an objectively reasonable person may have known or believed at or after the time of claim submission. Accordingly, for purposes of finding that the knowledge element of the False Claims Act is satisfied, what matters is what a defendant thought and believed when a claim was submitted or when they caused someone to submit a claim, not what they may have thought at a later time or a post hoc rationalization that might have rendered the claims accurate. Because determining the subjective intent of a defendant is a fact-specific inquiry, defendants are less likely to win early dismissals of complaints as a result of this case. So what does this mean for medical device companies? The intent and beliefs of your personnel and company may be determinative of whether you end up winning a False Claims Act case or required to pay millions or maybe hundreds of millions of dollars in civil monetary penalties under the False Claims Act. To be clear, after this case, a claim must still be false but whether the submission of a false claim is excused may depend on the subjective intent at the time the claim was submitted or at the time that your personnel may have caused your customer to submit a claim. If, for example, your sales personnel are inappropriately encouraging your customers to upcode or build more complex procedure codes and otherwise justified, their belief or knowledge or reckless disregard of the inappropriate nature of that coding or your company's belief or knowledge or reckless disregard regarding the same of the wrongfulness of that action may be determinative, even if there may be a post hoc rationalization for the coding under Medicare program rules. What does that mean? Emails, text messages, statements evidencing acknowledgement or belief that such actions are prohibited, or perhaps attempting to rationalize such actions because, quote, everyone in the industry is doing it, may serve as critical evidence in the False Claims Act case. Accordingly, today, it is even more important than before for your personnel to comply with your compliance policies and procedures, as well as to do what they and your company believes is correct conduct. Unfortunately, compliance decisions are occasionally made not based on what is prohibited, but based on what is commonly done in the industry. However, based on this case, a belief that certain activities are prohibited may now serve as evidence of a False Claims Act violation, in other words, satisfying the scienter requirements, even if an objectively reasonable industry participant would believe that the conduct is permissible. Accordingly, compliance personnel should ensure that they are appropriately training staff members to understand the scope of permitted conduct and the severe consequences that may result from engaging in actions that are prohibited or that are believed to be prohibited by your company or its personnel. 
I think this case is particularly important because of, there is a lot of ambiguity in the activities that medical device companies engage in, including potentially providing reimbursement information um, and making other recommendations uh, to their customers where there is substantial room um, for debate. And what this case effectively means is uh, that if someone believes that it's inappropriate uh, to provide certain advice or to encourage a customer to do uh, a certain activity that would result in the submission of a claim, um, that activity then should not occur because that, that intent um, may be sufficient uh, to satisfy the knowledge requirements of the violation of the False Claims Act. Uh, however, I will also note that claims must still be false in order to be a false claims under the False Claims Act. So ultimately, if Medicare payment policies or the other payer policies permit the submission of that claim, it would not necessarily rise to the level of a False Claims Act violation, even if your personnel thought that they were engaging in a False Claims Act violation. On June 6, the FDA announced the availability of draft guidance with updated recommendations for good clinical practices with the goal of modernizing the design and conduct of clinical trials. The draft guidance is adopted from the International Council for Harmonizations, ICH's recently updated E6R3 draft guideline. The draft guideline includes recommendations to address innovative design elements, as well as to encourage the use of fit for purpose innovative digital health technologies. As you're aware, the FDA's guidance documents do not establish legally enforceable responsibilities, and if and when finalized, instead would describe the agent's current, agency's current thinking on a topic um, and therefore should be viewed as recommendations. On June 6, the FDA posted a warning letter issued on May 25th to iRhythm Technologies Incorporated. This warning letter includes important information for manufacturers of devices that utilize a subscription platform or otherwise restrict healthcare providers from accessing patient data and also reiterates concerns regarding companies' alleged failure to submit 510Ks when they make product labeling or design changes. iRhythm manufactures a Zeo QX ECG monitoring system, which is intended to capture, analyze, and report symptomatic and asymptomatic cardiac events and continuous electrocardiogram information for long-term monitoring where real-time monitoring is not needed. The warning letter, however, alleges that the product is adulterated and misbranded because the company should have submitted a new 510K when it advertised the product as a cardiac telemetry monitor intended for high-risk patients with near real-time reporting. And the use of the device on this patient population would allegedly significantly affect the safety and effectiveness of the device. When the company made labeling changes as a result of a cap investigation, the FDA continued to allege that the labeling changes represented a major change or modification requiring the submission of a 510K. The warning letter also iterates changes that were made to the device, including changes to an algorithm that affected performance specifications that the FDA indicated would require the submission of a new 510K. In addition, the FDA alleged that the device was misbranded because it did not include adequate directions for use and did not adequately inform practitioners that there was a limit on the number of events that could be reported after which the device ceased to function as intended. Uh, this particular product had a cap on the number of events that it would report to healthcare providers after which it would cease functioning and shut off and require replacement. Uh, the device also had challenges with access of data if the product was not fully registered. Healthcare providers uh, allegedly were unable to access data if product registration was not completed. The letter addresses CAPA de process deficiencies, including a failure to address the transmission limit and the inaccessibility of data I just mentioned. The FDA took the position that both of these issues make the device no longer able to be used for its intended purpose and therefore non-conforming. In addition, the letter alleged MDR failures, including a failure to submit 30-day reports. Medical device manufacturers must ensure that marketing, labeling, and device changes are carefully reviewed to ensure that such changes do not require the submission of a new marketing submission and to ensure that that analysis is appropriately documented. In addition, as reflected in the letter, devices with software functions that shut off or render data not available raise significant concerns that should be carefully addressed in marketing submissions as well as in product labor. This warning letter has significant implications for subscription type devices, in other words, devices that cease functioning or render data unavailable at the end of a subscription. 
And the FDA took the position in this letter that it was an MDR reportable event and a malfunction for the device to cease transmitting events. Um, and in this case, the device uh, did not transmit an event where a significant arrhythmia occurred after the shutoff limit was reached. And the FDA effectively alleged that because of the failure to transmit, uh, that data was like the failure to transmit data was likely to cause or contribute to the death or serious injury of an individual. Accordingly, there's uh, greater concerns regarding subscription type devices uh, that involve information uh, that uh, failure to transmit it or uh, failure to function properly could result in death or serious injury to a patient. However, uh, effectively, the FDA also took the position that the product was not conforming even outside of the MD reportable standard. Um, and accordingly, uh, manufacturers should carefully review the ramifications of shutting off devices and limiting data at the end of a subscription, um, as well as to ensure that patients and providers are adequately warned and instructed regarding the ramifications of those shutoff procedures um, and the negative outcomes that can occur as a result of such deactivations. If you have a product that you intend to have a subscription with a shutoff right, uh, that should be clearly resolved in the uh, marketing submission and through discussions with the FDA to avoid this type of outcome. On June 1st, the FDA issued a request for public comment regarding how the FDA can support the development of medical technologies for use in non-clinical care settings, such as at home, to advance health equity. The request seeks input on the factors that should be considered in effectively instituting home-based care, the ways that digital health technology can support remote clinical trials and local or at-home-based care, how the FDA can facilitate access to medical technologies in remote locations, what processes, medical technologies, and medical procedures should be transitioned from care settings in, uh, to non-clinical care settings, such as at home, at school, or at work. Uh, the request also seeks comment on design attributes and features to facilitate the use of medical technology in non-clinical settings, the design attributes and features of digital health technology and other factors uh, that can be used to facilitate diverse the access and use by diverse patient populations in non-clinical care settings, um, as well as uh, requesting comment on the methods for evidence generation for review of medical technology that will be used in non-clinical care settings. Comments to this request are due by August 30th. Thank you for joining me this week for Medical Device Legal News. I'm Sam Bernstein, a partner in McGuire Healthcare Group. I would also like to thank my colleague, Sophie Moros, for helping to make today's program possible. Look forward to seeing you next time.